So the book of Amos, we have been going through that in our Bible studies on Tuesday evenings as I've been giving it. Um, and I, when Jason asked me to preach this morning, I thought, well, let's carry on. And we'll give just a quick introduction to the book of Amos for those who have not joined us on a Tuesday evening. The book of Amos is mainly focused on the northern tribe of Israel. So Israel was a united kingdom under David and Solomon. After Solomon, though, the kingdom split and became the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was ruled by a, a, a guy called Jeroboam. And immediately what Jeroboam did was to set up two altars, one at the north part of his kingdom and one at the south part of his kingdom, at Dan and at Bethel. What he also did was to set up two golden calves at those sites, one at the north, one at the south. Now that should immediately bring to your mind the calf that Aaron made when the Israelites came out of Egypt and God's response to that. So this kingdom was found on idolatry. The reason Jeroboam did that was because he didn't want the people to go back to the south to worship God in his temple. He was afraid that if the people went there and worshipped God, he would lose his power and lose his kingdom. So it was all about controlling the people. It was all about setting up their own way of worshipping God. And this proved through idols and false worship. And this went on for years and years. And they continued in their idolatry. Some of the most wicked kings are found in the northern tribes of, the, of Israel. So when, it, when Amos comes around, Amos is actually not from the northern kingdom. He's actually from the south. If you turn to chapter 1 of Amos, his introduction says the words of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before, before the earthquake. Now, Tekoa was a fortified city in the south of, of Judah, so the southern kingdom of Israel. And he was just a sheep breeder. He wasn't somebody, he wasn't uh, important to by his own words. He wasn't a professional prophet. He wasn't one of the prophets as Isaiah and Jeremiah were and Jonah. But he was taken to go to the northern kingdom and specifically deliver a message to them. Now the Jeroboam mentioned in verse 1 here is not the same Jeroboam, but this is Jeroboam the second. So many, many years later, there was another king called Jeroboam. And he was just as evil as his namesake. So the prophecy is mainly directed at Israel, the, the northern kingdom. So particularly when it's mentioned, Israel is mentioned during, in the prophets, it is the northern kingdom of Israel. Sometimes it is, it is both as a whole, especially when it's spoken about the house of Jacob. But here it is Israel. And we read of the great sins and the great evils that this northern kingdom commit before the Lord. And throughout this book we have God's word coming to them. At the beginning of chapter 3 and chapter 4 and chapter 5 we have this sentence, Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you. Hear this word. Hear this word. He's bringing to them God's word. He's not a prophet, a professional prophet, but he is a man with God's message. He is there to bring a prophecy against them. Now, of course, when you think about a prophecy, there's prophecies about as a very imagery. We think of Daniel, some parts of Daniel, Ezekiel, and especially the book of Revelation. There's a lot of imagery about that. Amos is not filled with that sort of imagery. There's, there is a, a lot of beautiful imagery inside of it, but it's about what God will do to this nation. And what we read in Amos chapter 9, he was saying, 
in, in verse 2, Though they dig into hell, from there my hand shall take them. Though they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. He's saying no matter where you go, you cannot run from me. You can climb as high as you want or you can go as low as you want. You can go somewhere where you think I can't see you or you can go somewhere as low and dark and hidden. But I, I see you and I will bring you out. There are warnings, but most importantly, there are promises made by God. And this is a reminder throughout the book that God is a God who fulfills his promises. Throughout the scriptures, promises of blessing and promises of cursing. It is God who gives these promises and it is God who fulfills these promises for us. Look quickly at chapter 8. In verse 7, God says, The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, Surely I will never forget any of their works. Shall the land not tremble for this, and everyone mourn who dwells in it? A reminder of the book in, of, uh, in Revelations where the seven churches says, I know your works, I know your deeds. But there when he was speaking about the churches, he's saying, I know some of your good deeds. I know what you've done. I know what good works you've done. But here he's speaking to them against their sins. Saying, I know your works. Should you not tremble at this, that God knows your works? God sees the sins that they committed. And they were committing, if you read just before that, verse 5 and 6, it's talking about falsifying scales by deceit. Saying, oh, well, some things weigh so much more, and they're hiding weights, changing things that nobody else could see but the person who changed them. God saw that. God could not be fooled by any sin. They were treating the poor wickedly. They were treating the people with evil. There was violence. But God prophesied that this will be punished. That sin is not left to carry on forever. And this is a great encouragement to God's people. That God doesn't leave the evil that we think goes on and on. Why, O oh Lord, do these men prosper? Why is it so plentiful? Why is this so evil, so rampant in our day and age? But we must remember that God sees all of it and has a time when it will end. In chapter 7 and 8, he also gives some visions where God relents from punishing. But there's two where it says, I will no longer relent. The time will come when I will bring about my promises. And so we come to chapter 9. And Amos says, I saw the Lord standing by the altar. Well, we ask ourselves, what altar is this? And I think it's the altars of the idol, of the idols that they had set up, those altars in Dan and Bethel, where they were worshipping to their false gods. You couldn't keep God away from there. God is there and he sees it regardless. He sees the sin that they committed. He sees the, the false worship that they were giving. Still in his name, they were keeping festivals that, that he had set up, but their hearts were far from him. They were doing just those things that they enjoyed doing. They kept those things in worship that were, that were pleasant to them, especially those feasts. But here the Lord is standing by these altars as a judgment against them. And we think about when the ark was taken into, by the Philistines, it was put in the temple or the tent of Dagon, and what happened? He was standing by that, that idol, and that idol collapsed on his face. And here God is standing by these altars, standing by this tabernacle, as it were, this temple that they had established. 
And he's saying to them, strike the doorposts that the thresholds may shake and break them on the heads of them all. Well, the doorposts were, were the pillars that, that held them up, the strength. And what was that in the people? It was their way of worship. It was the leaders who were leading them in these ways of evil. And God says, I will slay the last of them with the sword. And we read in the rest of the scriptures that the Assyrians come and do destroy these people with the sword. Jeroboam is said to is prophesied to die by the sword, and in the scriptures that is fulfilled, exactly so. He dies by the sword. And God says, He who flees from them shall not get away, and he who escapes from them shall not be delivered. There was a time where the sins of the people caught up with them, and God was warning them that this was so. Remember when Jonah went to Nineveh, he warned them and said, God will bring about judgment. They repented from the very greatest to the very least. The king himself took off his clothes, put on sackcloth, went in ashes and repented before God. And Jonah moaned about it. He said, man, I knew you would do this, that's why I didn't want to come. But God did. He relented and he gave grace and forgiveness to those people. But here we find the Israelites. Not just once has God come to them, but repeatedly. There have been prophets coming again and again and again to warn them, to say, come, come back to God, worship Him in holiness, worship Him as you should, worship Him in His temple. Remember the covenant that He has made with us. Remember that we are in the covenant promises and we need to worship Him, this covenant God, in the way He wants. But they had forsaken it again and again. And so now the time has come that these sins will be paid for. And the evil will catch up with them. And it says in verse 2 and 3, Though they dig into hell, from there my hand will, will, shut, will take them. Though they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. And though they hide themselves on top of Carmel, from there I will search and take them. Though they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea, from there I will command the serpent, and it shall bite them. You can run, but you cannot hide from God. He's saying in verse 4, Though they go into captivity before their enemies, from there I will command the sword, and it shall slay them. Well, we think of Lot's wife. She was pulled by the angels to a to Flee from one judgment. Remember in Sodom, the Lord was about to send fire and hail, and Lot and his wife and kids were pulled. But on the way, what happened to her? She turned back and she was turned into a pillar of salt. As a warning, the same as this. You can escape one judgment, but you will not escape the next. That should be a great humbling for us all. And God says to them, I will set my eyes on them for harm and not for good. What a, what a terrible thing to, to think about. Imagine hearing that from God's ears. And that's the last thing that you will hear. There are people who love to claim the good and wonderful, encouraging promises of God in the Bible. You know, Jeremiah 29, 11. This is one of the most popular and in its context, very good. But God says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Well, that was said to the southern kingdom of Israel, but to God's people. But that was a hope they had, and people love to remember this and say that to each other. Oh, God knows the hope that he has for you, the good that he wants to be with you. What about Amos, chapter 9, verse 4? My eyes set on them for harm and not for evil, and, and not for good. There are some that will be hearing this, 
some that will not hear the gospel and the good news and the promises that is, are in Christ that your sins are forgiven. There will be some on, those, on that day when Christ will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Just as there will be many who will be, who will be here, come to my right hand and join me in the supper and celebration of the Lamb. Verses 5 and 6, the Lord God of hosts, he who touches the earth and it melts, and all who dwell there mourn, and it shall swell like the river, and subdue like the river of Egypt. He who builds his layers in the sky, and has founded his strata in the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea, and pours them out on the face of the earth, the Lord is his name. Another very familiar uh, piece in Amos, he declares God's sovereignty and power in all of creation. And each time he does that, he ends with the phrase, the Lord is his name. And this is the Lord, if you look in your Bibles, it's the capital L-O-R-D. And that is where the covenant name of God is, kept, is written, Yahweh. The covenant God, Yahweh, is his name. Nobody else controls the earth. Nobody else controls the weather. Nobody else, else controls the things in the earth, but God alone. His might, his power, his sovereign creative power is our hope. It is our joy, but also remember who you are in light of who he is. He has done that and we've seen it again and again. Remember the Israelites, what they saw, what the history they had of God's power over creation. The parting of the Red Sea the parting of the Jordan. And this was said two years before the earthquake. Remember in chapter, Amos 1 verse 1. And it's recorded in a historian that this earthquake was so big that it moved a mountain a quarter of a mile. So this, this earthquake was so massive it was recorded. It was well mentioned. When they said the earthquake, they knew what they were talking about. And where did that come from? It came from the Lord. The Lord is his name. But then he goes on to verse 7. Are you not like the people of Ethiopia to me, O children of Israel? What oh, terrible I mean, to think, yeah, what we've seen God's sovereign hand. Yes, we've seen God's hand in, in creation and it's always been for us. Look what he did, did to Jericho. Look what he did to the, to the Egyptians. But he turns around and says, but are you not like the Ethiopians? Now the Ethiopians were God's enemies. Right? They were an enemy to Israel, constantly battling them. In many passages in Psalm 68, in Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, they are mentioned as enemies, not children of God. He says, well, we have the exodus. You know, we, we still, God is with us. He says, well, did I not bring you up from Israel, from the land of Egypt? Yes, I did. But in the same ways, he says, the Philistines I did from Capital, and the Assyrians from Kerr. They also have their little exodus story where, where they migrated. They came to be established in a certain land too. But what was the distinct, distinction here? God didn't reveal themselves to them. God revealed himself to the people of Israel. And they, in turn, have turned away from him. In verse 8 he says, Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are on the sinful kingdom. Again, imagine hearing this. This is God's people who dwelt in security, thought, we're okay. Everything's okay with us. We've got these great and wonderful promises. But here they have one promise. I will set my eyes on them for harm and not for good. And here he's calling them the sinful kingdom. Not his children, not his delight, the sinful kingdom. He also calls them a sinful nation in Isaiah chapter 1. 
God doesn't pretend we don't have sin. And we don't need to pretend that we don't have sin when we come before the Lord. That is the great glory that Christ is our high priest. Because he is without sin. We don't have to be without sin. Because we have sin, we come to Christ. And as it doesn't end there at verse 8, I will, uh, on the sinful kingdom, I will destroy it from the face of the earth. That's not where this book ends. And that's not where God's promises ended either. And there's great encouragement to be taken for Israel's future but a warning for those who are still sinners who refuse to repent. And throughout Scripture, that is our glorious hope. That is the promise that we stand upon. That is the reason we are meeting this morning, is because Christ died, because Christ rose from the dead and was raised up and sits at God's right hand as our high priest before him, that we can come and say, we have sinned. And we repent of it and bring it before you. They were trying to hide it. And God is saying, yes, come and hide it in me. Turn with me to Amos chapter 2. Get the right... Sorry, Amos chapter 3 and verse 7 and 8. Oh, verse 8. This is one of the marked distinctions of the book of Amos. He says, A lion has roared. The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? The lion has roared. No one's going to run towards a roaring lion. That roaring lion, he's roaring, and that brings about fear. And all the animals in the kingdom that hear the roaring lion run. But this is what this roaring lion is saying. Come to me. In the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe, it is said, he is not a tame lion. Is he safe? Of course he's not safe. But he's good. And that is one of the blessed, most blessed things in the scripture. This lion that we must fear is the lion to whom we must run. The one whom we've committed sins against is the one that we must go to to be forgiven. For he said, all those who come to me I will in no wise cast out. That's our glorious hope. This lion will not devour us if we come to him. Take your sins before him and don't hide them from him. Let them be covered by the blood of Christ. Well, verse 9, well, the second half of verse 8, he says, yes, I, Yet I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob. There's the, t- the pivot. Okay, but, but I, but I, Their hope was not in themselves. Their hope was not in their repenting. Their hope was in what God would do for them. He says, For surely I will command and will sift the house of Israel among all the nations. As grain is sifted in a sieve, yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. But all the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, who say the calamity shall not overtake nor confront us. There were still these doubters. There were those who did not believe God's word, did not believe that this would come about. There are those who do not believe that Christ will come again. There are those who do not believe that Christ can take away our sins, even though they believe he might come again. Christ alone can take away our sins. Christ alone is our, is our high priest and our hope. Now he's saying he's going to sift the house of Israel among all the nations. 
So sifting is putting the grain through a sieve. This idea is to keep or isolate that which is desired, either in it or out of it. But what the context suggests that the grain was put through the sieve to ensure that the correct size particles were kept. That nothing it will be lost regardless of size. No matter how small, no matter how tiny, not one grain is lost. Now when you're sifting, I mean even if you are, for example, at home, maybe some people can do it better than I can, but if you are cooking rice and you need to just pour the rice once you've boiled it into a sieve, I always lose some rice. And I couldn't be bothered. But it's easy. Just you lose one tiny little one here and there. It doesn't seem to matter. But not the smallest grain will be lost because the smallest grain is of, is of concern to God. That is what he's still saying. No matter how small you are, no matter who you are in Israel, no matter who you are today, the smallest person, the most insignificant person, the, most, the greatest sinner, will not be left. If you come to him, he will in no wise cast you out. But the warning is that all of the sinners of my people will die by the sword. And that was very literal. They died by the sword of their enemies that came and were used by God in a judgment. The calamity shall not overtake nor confront us, they thought. We're sitting in pretty ease and comfort. At this time, Israel had trouble with the enemies. They had sort of shrunk a little bit in terms of territory. And Jeroboam II had come and expanded that far beyond any other king had done. Beyond what David did, beyond even what Solomon did. In terms of land. So they were sitting in ease. They were sitting in comfort. They were sitting and thinking, wow, things are going well for us. Surely God is with us. Surely God likes us because, and is happy with us because whatever we're doing is working. They judged everything by what they saw and what they had. They were not resting in the truth of that their hearts were worshipping God. They were resting in what they had at home. And they did not believe what would come in the future. The last week I did, we, we spoke with the kids in Sunday school about Paul going on his missionary, uh, <clears throat> on his last journey to Rome where he was captured in Jerusalem. And it was told to him, you by an angel, you will see Caesar. You will stand before Caesar. And then you read about all the troubles that Paul had on his journey. The storm that lasted, I think, two weeks. I mean, I've been in a storm on the sea for a few hours, and it's frightening. He was on there for two weeks in a small boat that they couldn't get away from. They then crashed the boat onto, onto ground, onto the island of Malta. And what happened there? He's building a fire. A snake comes out, bites him on his hand. And immediately they think, oh, this guy must be a murderer or something bad because... He escaped one judgment. Oh, but now he cannot escape this one. So what did he do? He shook it loose, chucked it in the fire, carried on with life. Why? Because he, through all of that, he remembered. No, but God promised me I'm going to go to Rome. I'm going to go in front of Caesar. So whether I'm sitting in the storm or the snake is on my hand, God has promised. And none of this is going to make me doubt what God has promised. That is the man of faith, as opposed in, the, in contrast to these doubters. And do we walk like that every day? Yeah, but God has promised he's coming. God has promised that I will be with him. God has promised that I'm his child because he has said so, because I've brought my sins to him. And then we come to <clears throat> verses 11 and 12. And Lord willing, in my next study on Amos, I would like to focus a lot more time on this. I, I sort of brushed past it at first until I heard a fantastic 
uh, description of what this tabernacle of David truly is. He says, On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David which has fallen down and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. Says the Lord who does this thing. Now remember the, <clears throat> what I mentioned, the Lord is his name. After each time we're speaking about God's creative power in showing his sovereignty over all creation. And here it's saying, the Lord who does this thing. Okay, it's the Lord who does this thing again. Who's going to do this great and mighty power? God. And we find ourselves within the fruits of this wonderful promise that God kept so many thousands of years ago. On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David which has fallen down. Now the tabernacle of David was distinct to the actual tabernacle of Moses. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 27. Remember we read that at the beginning that was our call to worship. Now this is a psalm of David that he wrote. And he's saying, one thing I've desired that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. When David wrote this, the temple was not built. Okay? There was a tent for the ark. And he's saying, <clears throat> he shall hide me in his pavilion, <clears throat> pardon me, in the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. And these words are for a dwelling, a tent. That's what God lived in. Turn over to Psalm 31, verses 19 and 20. He mentions it again. Another Psalm of David. Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you. Remember, we're speaking about faith and promise in the promises of God. You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence from the plots of men. You shall keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Again, there's a word used there for tent, for tabernacle. And then turn with me back, turn back with me to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 6. So God, so David was used to meeting with the Lord in his tabernacle. In his house. In two, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, we have the, the story of when David brings the, the ark back to Jerusalem. It was taken by the Philistines. It went to uh, uh, a Philistine, Abinadab, and it was there for a few months, and then it was moved. And when it was moved, one of his sons tried to touch the ark, Uzziah, and he touched the ark, and the Lord struck him. It then went to the house of Obed-Edom. So, in verse 11. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And what was, the striking thing about this is that Obed-Edom is not an Israelite. He's a Gittite. Now, Gittites were from Gath. Do you know what I mean? Can anyone think who else came from Gath in the Bible? There's one very, very famous person who came from Gath, and he was a bad guy. Goliath. Goliath of Gath. And yet here, this man, who was not a born Israelite, was a God-fearing man. And this, this ark, this precious presence of God, that only the Levites could carry, was taken into his house. Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him, because the ark of God, because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. 
So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Go to verse 17. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. This wasn't the, te- the tabernacle that Moses had erected. That was the tabernacle that David had erected. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. He was not a priest. He was not a Levite. But he offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished, burnt off- offering, finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And then just chapter 7, verse 22 to 29, very quickly. This is his prayer before the Lord. Therefore you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, nor is there any God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people, like Israel, to the one nation on the earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make for himself a name? And to do for yourself great and awesome deeds for your land, before your people who you, who you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, the nations and their gods. For you have made your people Israel, your very own people forever, and you, Lord, have become their God. Now, O Lord God, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as you have said. So let your name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God over Israel. And let the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, have revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore your servant has found it in his heart to pray this prayer to you. And now, O Lord God, you are God and your words are true and you have promised this goodness to your servant. Now therefore let it please you to bless the house of your servant that it may continue before you forever. For you, O Lord God, have spoken it with your blessing. Let the house of your servant be blessed forever. What was significant about this tabernacle, this house of David, in contrast to the Mosaic tabernacle? This tabernacle did not have a dividing wall. There was no holy of holies as a, in the same way. This, this ark, of God's presence was inside that tabernacle and David could go into it. Now there are many other wonderful things about David's worship that he established. Singing and praising God was mainly established by David. And one other thing that he, when David put it on, it was put on Mount Zion. Not Mount Moriah, where the temple was built. It was Mount Zion. And within the scriptures, if you read what is the hope and rest of restoration, it is the restoration of Mount Zion. Because that is where the hope was, where God's undivided presence was, where, his, where we could access him. Where David, who wasn't a priest, who wasn't a Levite, could go before him, offer him his burnt sacrifices, bring his sins before him and seek him in trouble. This was the great and glorious tabernacle of David. And this is what God is saying. I will raise up what? Not the tabernacle of Moses, not the temple of of Solomon. I will raise up the tabernacle of David. The tent, not where I dwelt eternally in 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 one place, but in a place where I dwelt with my people where they could come in to, to meet with me and worship me. This is the great hope, where God has opened himself to his people, opened himself to sinners, that there is no dividing wall. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, he says, Obed-Edom was a Gentile. Another one we speak of is, is um, Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba. This man himself was not a, an Israelite. He was not born an Israelite. Yet we, throughout the worship of David, the tabernacle of David becomes this imagery of the Davidic worship. 
where God could be worshipped and God was praised by Israelites as well as by Gentile. That there was no exclusion. This was a picture of Christ coming. This was an, a type of Christ. This tabernacle where we worship God. It's not this building. It's not some tent somewhere else. It is the person of Christ. We're both Israelite and Jew together. Israelite and Gentile come together with no dividing wall between them and no dividing wall between them and God. Let's close when we will read Psalm 91. This, was like, this is the great and glorious promise that God gave to Israel, Israel. And God fulfilled it in Christ. That tabernacle has been rebuilt. Psalm 91 verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now think about that again. This is David. He dwells in the secret place of the Most High. Well, secret because God can be seen or found elsewhere, but he was inside this tabernacle. David could go inside the secret place of God. We can go in and access God's secret place and, do, and abide under the shadow of the Almighty. This is where his presence was. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. The Israelites could not say that. That was not them. God was not their refuge. He was not their fortress. They had built their own altars. They had trusted in their own selves. They had now trusted in their own armies because of the kingdom they've expanded. But what does God want? What did He promise to say? I will establish the tabernacle of David, that house where my name will be praised, the secret place where you can come before me. And he wants us to say of him that he is my refuge and fortress, my God in him I will trust. And God alone is our trust. In his promises alone we must trust. And the Lord Jesus is his name. Amen.